one woman for the rest of your life. How crazy. He says that's actually not what's happening here. He's not limiting his options. What he's actually doing is the following. He's saying to her, everything I ever wanted in a woman from today, I choose to find it in you. Something stirred in my spirit at that moment. I was thinking, why didn't I think of that? Can you imagine what my wedding day would have been like <laughs> if I came up with a line like that? <laughs> uh, everything I ever wanted in a woman from today, I choose to find it in you. Oh, man, so while, while the ceremony is carrying on and stuff is happening, I'm thinking, man, when I get home... <laughs> Belinda wasn't with me at that point. <laughs> I'm thinking, when I get home, uh, you know, the cup of tea out on the stoop there, whatever. And listen, there's something I always wanted to tell you, you know. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I'm thinking of this. And, and so, all right, everything works out well in the wedding. You know, they go off to the reception and I get into the car and I go home. And while I'm driving home, I'm, you know, planning and plotting and wondering how she's going to take this. And suddenly this thought strikes me. Every wedding, every marriage is a prophetic portrayal of the relationship that Christ has with his bride, the church. And in that moment, I'm thinking, what if he is looking at me and saying, everything I ever wanted in a human companion, I choose to find it in you. I came undone. I don't know how I got home, but through the tears, it, it, there are very few moments in my life that I remember being so deeply disturbed like that one. And I remember arguing with him while I'm behind the wheel. Like, this is so unfair. I know who you are, and I know what you deserve. I know who I am and what you're looking for. I'm only going to disappoint you. I said to him, what you're looking for, I don't have it in me. I'll never forget his response. He said, I know. And that's why I'm washing it into you. Washing it into me. He says, I'm washing it into you so that when I come looking for it, it will be there. And suddenly, one of the conversations I had with him years ago clicks into place. I remember reading Ephesians 5 and wondering, you know, that Christ is washing his bride with the water of his word. And I'm thinking... What is there about me that is so dirty that even the blood cannot wash it out of me? That you have to wash me with the water of your word. He never answered me. You know, sometimes when you ask God questions and he doesn't answer, it's probably because you're framing the question from the wrong perspective or that you haven't got a clue. And he's not going to argue or answer. He's waiting for you to get with the program. And suddenly with that moment, I realized... The blood is there to wash things out of me. But the water is there to wash something into me. Suddenly Esther 2 verse 12 becomes so logical. You remember Esther, the woman who was chosen to be queen. And she had to go through a preparation phase. And she spent, it was a one year preparation phase. The first six months, she had to spend eight hours a day in the bath every day for six months. The second six month period, she had to spend eight hours a day in the bath for six months. I'm, I remember reading this and wondering, who failed kind of amazing and I say, <laughs> how dirty does a girl have to be to have to spend a year in the bath? can imagine she, I mean, <laughs> I, I spend longer than 20 minutes in the bath and I'm looking like this, you know, grandpa, ancient, shriveled, <laughs> a year in the bath. And then 
when I read it again, I realize, okay, but the stuff that she was being bathed in, the point was that that stuff needed to be absorbed into her being. After a year bathing in that stuff, I can imagine Whenever the queen walked into the palace, everybody knew who she was and that she was here. Because the fragrance that she exuded was just unmistakable. And then suddenly Paul's comment becomes so relevant where he says that we are exuding the, favor, the, the fragrance of Christ into this world. For some people, it's a reminder that they too have passed from death to life because they recognize the fragrance of His presence in my life. For other people, it's a reminder of what they have rejected. I did tell my wife that. It didn't have the kind of effect that I thought it would have. <laughs> the church, the body of Christ, the people, his household. Man, are we not privileged to be part of a family? Every time we meet someone, something of the fragrance of Christ is evident. And we are reminded that we have, been, we have passed from death to life. The fragrance of his presence just exuding from one another. It must be such an incredibly, it's an incredibly powerful thing. Yeah, and then there are people who say, church, don't get me started. Church, never been more hurt, never experienced so much pain in my life than when I was in church. You invite people to church and say, man, I've got enough problems. Why do I want to go to church and get more? You know, I'm thinking, these, these guys are clueless. They don't understand what church is and what church does. We know that church is his body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 tells us that we, each of us individually, are members of that body. I love the way Eugene Peterson, in his uh, paraphrase of this particular passage, puts, puts it together in Ephesians 1, 23. He says, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Now, the word peripheral, I suppose, no, that is, uh, okay, big word. Let, let's try and break it down. Peripheral, um, around the edges. The church is not something that's like on the edge of society, not really part of you know, the heart of community or whatever. The church is not, he says, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. In other words, the church is actually the center of what society is supposed to be built around. Strange how our society has shifted things to such a degree that the church seems to have become a rond figuur. This die owns die on account. Those guys out there, you know, who get together on Sunday mornings, a weird bunch, you know. But then he goes on to say, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts and by which he fills everything with his presence. I was really struck when I discovered what Jesus was busy praying on the cross. You remember the the words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there are probably well-meaning teachers who would explain things like that with, you know, and I don't want to go into the deep theological discussions around that, but when I read John 19.31, something stirred and I realized, but wait a minute, John 19.31, it is finished, is actually the last sentence of Psalm 24, no, 22, sorry. It's the last sentence of Psalm 22. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the opening line of Psalm 22. So John and two of the other Gospels are telling us that Jesus, in his moments of anguish, his final breath, he's busy praying Psalm 22. 
And then the writer of Hebrews reminds us that this is the case in Hebrews 2 verse 12 when he tells us that Jesus was quoting Psalm 22 verse 22. Okay, so now I have four places in the New Testament telling me that Jesus was praying Psalm 22 on the cross. And verse 22 says, I love the way the Amplified phrases that, in the midst of the worshiping congregation, I will sing hymns of praise to you, Father. Jesus, in his moments of anguish, is looking beyond the pain of the cross, as Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us, that he endured the cross, despised the shame, because he was seeing, he was looking forward to a joy. And that joy he describes in Psalm 22, 22, as the joy of being in the midst of the worshiping congregation, singing hymns of praise to the Father. Guys, when we get together as a church, it's not just, hello, Uchanad, lekker, donkey, and yay. How was your week? Awesome, thank you. That's part of it, but that's not the main course. The main course is that we become the backing vocal choir to the voice. That started everything going. The voice that said, well, read Genesis 1. It's that voice. And God said, everything that God has said, it's that voice that was speaking. Hebrews 1, the first three verses is telling us. That everything that we know, everything that exists is being sustained, maintained, upheld, propelled by the voice, the word of God, the word of his power. So we as a local church become the backing choir to the voice that resonates and reverberates throughout all of eternity. What is that voice doing? That voice is glorifying the Father, exalting the Father, singing hymns of praise to the Father. What a privilege. Those of you who thought being on stage is what it's all about, get a clue. You are what it's all about. When you lift your voice to sing, you're backing Him as He worships the Father. What a privilege. What a privilege. Okay, so this, the, Christ, the body is Christ's church in which he speaks. <laughs> now suddenly Zephaniah 3 verse 17 becomes so relevant. Okay, the Lord our God in the midst of us is mighty. He's the one who saves. He's the one who is rejoicing over you. The one who is dancing for joy in the midst of the worshiping congregation. This is who he is. Psalm 32 tells us that we are being surrounded by songs of deliverance. Who is singing those songs of deliverance? He is. And then another disturbing thought. How many of you have heard the voice of Jesus in the worshiping congregation? Not entirely sure. But okay, so how do, what does the voice of Jesus sound like? Okay, so he, in the spirit, he needs a physical voice. So guess what? Where does he dwell? Within. That's where he reclines, that's his couch, the praises of his people is the couch or the recliner or the throne that gets put together for him to come and rest. But whose voice is he using to worship the Father? This voice, this voice, this voice, this voice, that voice. These Voices become his instrument. My voice 
give sound to his verse as I worship. And then, on Sunday mornings, we have people who fold their arms and look at the worship leader and say, I dare you, get me excited. I dare you, sing something I know and like. I think it was Francis Chan who mentioned, I mean, he's standing at the door as people are filing out, and one of the guys asks one of the guys who's leaving, how did you enjoy the worship this morning? And the guy says, oh, I really didn't enjoy the worship this morning. And they sang stuff I didn't know in keys I couldn't sing, and, you know, this and that and the other. And Francis Chan, he says, he chips in and he says, it's okay, we weren't worshiping you. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks, in which he acts. How does he move, act in the church? Well, 1 Corinthians 12 gives us an idea of the gifts that he has invested into this body. And as we begin to serve each other, never mind what that gift may be, we experience him engaging with us through the body, the members of the body who share, who stir, who comment, who bless, who empower, who enable, who bring spiritual insight. I mean, the, the spectrum of gifts and their operation within the local church. We, we, <laughs> let's not go there now. But one of the amazing things about this is that he, as he is using our voice, to sing hymns of praise to the Father, so he is using these bodies to touch, to embrace. These voices to pray, to bless, to enable, to encourage, to inspire, to motivate. Those gifts are serving his body. He is acting in his body. In which he speaks in which he acts, and by which he fills everything with his presence. And that's kind of awkward, difficult to get your head around. And we, as a leadership, grappled at some stage with this whole picture of how does he fill everything with his presence. <laughs> and then I was struck by Proverbs 31. You know Proverbs 31, don't you? Ladies, how many of you remember Proverbs 31 from verse 10 onwards? Yeah, yeah. The excellent wife, the dear same Frau, for those of you who are familiar with the Afrikaans old translation. So what's this woman all about? I, I realize, you know, some of us ladies, we kind of cringe when we look at this and we think, <laughs> I'm not measuring up, you know. Uh, and some of you ladies, well-meaning mothers, trying to train your daughters and say, this, this is the standard, right? Okay? How many of you girls are kind of confronted by that? Let me tell you a quickly story. Um, let me quickly tell you a story. A friend of mine is telling me he's listening to the radio, and there's this woman sharing her testimony on the radio. Um, uh, she was married to this guy who was really not a nice character. He actually put her through a lot of... He put her under a lot of pressure and, um, you know, got to the point where she was kind of, she couldn't do anything to please him. And whatever she did was either not good enough or, you know, the opposite of what he wanted and so on. Eventually, he got to the point where he was writing out lists every morning before he went to work, saying to her, these are the things I want you to do while I'm away, you know, kind of thing. And, and she says most evenings when he came home, she hadn't done everything on the list. And obviously, it was a very uncomfortable experience. He passed away early on in their marriage. As far as I'm concerned, by the grace of God, she was released. And obviously, that made her very cautious about the second marriage. Um, but eventually, she yeah, fell in love with this guy. He proposed, and they got married. And one of the, she says she remembers that the most difficult conversations that she would have would be to get out of him what he wants her to do. Because he was, you know, what he said to her, bottom line, honey, you don't have to do anything for me. The fact that you love me and I love you, that's good enough for me. And she kind of felt at sea. What am I supposed to do? So, so she started doing the stuff that she enjoyed as a homemaker and so on and so on. 
Even, you know, one day she says she's cleaning, doing the spring cleaning thing, and she happens to knock a shoebox or something off of a top shelf, and the stuff spills out, and she looks at it and she says, oh, keepsakes from school, varsity, that kind of stuff, photos. And in that box was one of the lists that her previous husband wrote. So she picked up this list, and that moment of anxiety, you know, looking at this list, and then she suddenly realized most days of the week, By the time her current husband gets home, she's already done all of that and more. And the phrase that she wrapped up that conversation with struck and stuck. She said, a passionate lover will outperform an obedient servant on any given day. Do you know what Proverbs 31 is telling us? It's telling us the story of a passionate lover. Proverbs 31 is probably the best description in the Old Testament that you can find of the New Testament church. This is what this woman, this bride, this church, this body of Christ is doing for her own family and for the community. His name, her husband, is honored and he gets the place of honor amongst the judges in the city gate, because of what she is doing. Her passion just flows into every relationship that she has. Her passion for him, her passion for her family, her passion for the people in the community that are hurting and who need attention. That passion is taking her into life with gusto. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, and by which he fills everything with his presence. As leaders, we grappled with this, and we thought maybe if we put a picture together, it would help people to understand this principle. So I've included that picture on one of these slides. I hope, yeah, there we go. You see, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is at the center, at the heart of what it means to have a quality community. And the healthy spirituality of the church causes the other aspects of society to be influenced positively. Because, for example, in the environment of education, we have Christ-centered teachers who are engaging in that space, bringing a perspective that the world cannot offer, bringing a sense of meaning and significance into children's lives that they would never have if a Christ-centered teacher were not part of that teaching staff. The media, social media, public, well, broad, mainstream media, whatever it may be, We have believers in the media bringing hope, bringing life, bringing light, bringing joy into those spaces. And so you can see arts and culture, sports, social society, business, government. When we have a healthy spirituality, when the church is vibrant, when the church is being what it is, guess what happens? We find that overflowing so that the mentality and the productivity as well as the lifestyle of the people in the community get lifted into the space that God intended them to have. This is the vision that I want to leave you with this morning. So let's wrap it up with Galatians 6, first five verses. In the message, I love the way the message phrases this. Maybe I should preface that with a comment by Pierre Spies not the current Pierce Pierce, his father, was privileged to be under his ministry from time to time uh, early on. As I was a youngster, he was kind of one of the leaders at that stage, and he made a comment. He said, vision is knowing what God is doing and understanding my part in it. It doesn't help that much to give you, this is the picture, and then, okay, so where do I engage? Mm, Sorry, can't help you. Galatians 5 gives us incredible advice in terms of how we, as his body engage, not in, actually within and beyond the church. Galatians 5.1, live creatively, friends. <laughs> I don't know if you realize that, but to, you know, the word creative and reactive, 
It's pretty much the same letters. The only letter that moves is the C. Wherever you put the C, if you put the C in the middle, in the middle of everything that's happening, if, where, if your vantage point is I'm stuck in the middle and everything's happening around me, uh, you're probably going to be confused. But if your vantage point is at the start where you're seeing Christ and then engaging from there, you will probably be able to live creatively. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments for yourself. <laughs> you might be needing forgiveness before the day is out. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh, man. Let me just stop a moment there. The forgiveness thing. You know, every now and then, some prominent church leader does or says stuff, and everybody's on him like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then we, as just your normal standard everyday church goer, we feel, oh, my goodness. Is this church thing real? Is this Jesus thing real? Uh, if those guys can do that, uh, I mean, what chance do I stand? I, I want to release you of that tension, people. My son, Jason, he's a drummer. He's not a musician. He's a drummer. Um, yeah. If you're a musician, you're a pianist, a violinist, a vocalist, a bassist, a cellist, a whatever -ist. You can't be a drummist. <laughs> if you're a drummer, you're not a musician. But okay, that's between him and me. In any case, a prominent church leader, total disruption, whatever. And he and I were sitting and chatting because we enjoyed this guy's teaching. And we actually shared a lot of his comments and clips and whatever. And we were sitting down doing coffee. And Jason said to me, you know, he's discovered something and someone else helped him with a blog that was posted um, with a comment. He says, if you look at the disciples, 120 in the upper room, Jesus starts out with 12. And Judas is part of the 12, <laughs> right? And in the upper room, Judas is no longer there. And, all right, Jesus is also no longer there. But of the 120, let's assume that at least one came to follow Jesus through Judas. And now Judas is no longer there. Uh, in fact, Judas has undermined everything that Jesus taught. And then this guy makes a comment. He says, truth remains truth. Not because of what Judas does, but because of who Jesus is. Man, that was so, there was such a sense, gave me such a sense of hope. If my hope is in Jesus, never mind Judas. Never mind Peter. <laughs> Peter was restored. Judas wasn't. Hope, truth is truth because of who Jesus is. The forgiveness thing. I asked, I asked him at one stage, how is it that you could be on the cross in the moment of the most excruciating pain and still pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. How could you pray that? His answer to me really shook me. He said, at that point, I needed to move what I thought of them out of my pain into my purpose for them. I knew that within the next week, I would probably looking some of the, be looking some of these guys in the face. And I wanted to see them with compassion, not with accusation and incrimination. That shifted something for me in terms of the weight and the value of forgiveness. Verse 2, stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed, share their burdens, and so complete Christ's law. And if you think you are too good for that, you are badly deceived. Finally, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given. Then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Man, I love the way he wraps this up in verse 5. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Let me encourage you as you realize that you in the worshiping congregation are giving him your voice. And through who you are and what you do in the local church, you are giving him your hands to bless and to encourage and to support others. 
And through who you are in the community, you are exuding the fragrance of Christ, reminding people of His presence and His grace. And if there are those who are being confronted with, this is what they are rejecting, that's between them and Him. It's not your issue. Don't make it your issue. It's not you they're rejecting. It's Him. Would you mind if I prayed with you? Father, thank you for the grace that you have extended to us in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Thank you for including us in that reference. Thank you for enabling us to partner with you, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, in dwelling within us, provide the energy and the desire that is needed to fully serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We embrace that and thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Rick. So we love our altar calls. That means that we want to respond to the message. So if the facilitators, the ministry team, if you can come up and the leaders. Um, so first off, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, you're not sure if you die today, you're going to go to heaven then I want you to respond and you're going to come to the team and you're going to say, hey, I need Jesus. I need the forgiveness of, of sin. And then a couple of groups of people that I want to call forward. So what, what Rick represents to me is people that have been in worship ministry, but you've been hurt by, hurt by church. Not that Rick's not, maybe you've had your fair share of church politics and, and hurt, etc. But I meet so many people that have been in ministry, especially in the creative side of, of, of ministry, and then they get hurt. And God wants to sort you out today so that you can still give your voice um, to Jesus. So if that's you, please come to the front. And then just as an extension of our, of our freedom encounter, if you struggle with any kind of, you, you sense like there's a supernatural, almost like a curse on your life in a specific area, you're struggling with anxiety or, or depression or fear or there's a, there's a sin that you need to confess, this is the time to come forward and just say, hey, listen here, I'm struggling with this. And please, Lord, please forgive me. You should have seen on Friday night when people confessed all their sins, the joy that was in the room. Okay, so sometimes it's just simple as that. Hey, Lord, I was critical. Lord, I, I forgive that person. I forgive my dad. Great. So I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. We'll give 30 seconds because my wife's going to be on my case if we go over time because apparently the kids are wild. They were wild last time. So just 30 seconds. Do you need to respond?